We can be opening to 2 Timothy chapter 3. No doubt some familiar verses, but I think oftentimes we kind of skim through them without looking at them. If time allows, I'd like to look at the first five verses in a little more detail. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 say this, Know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despised of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Amen. Now here Paul tells us this know also was something he wants us to pay particular attention to to know this. You often use phrases like that, or I wouldn't have you be ignorant, brethren. Or, Amen. We ought to pay attention to what he is telling us. And he says that in the last days perilous times shall come. And there's a lot of different theories on what these last days are. Some suppose it's from the time of Christ or the time of the apostles till now. Others say that it's the time immediately preceding the return of Christ. But in Hebrews chapter 1 describes the last days as happening presently. Mm -hmm. So I think we are living in the last days or the latter days as it might be called. But in these last days, he says, perilous times shall come, or difficult times, dangerous times, harsh times, hard to bear times. And certainly it's not going to get any easier as time goes on. Anyway, trying to serve God, well, it's only going to get more difficult, more Amen. dangerous even, more harsh to try to serve God right. Amen. And he gives us why these times shall be perilous in the next four verses. He says, for men shall be lovers of their own souls. Amen. No, it's not that loving yourself is a bad thing necessarily. In Ephesians 5, 29, when describing the relationship between a husband and wife, he says, no man hath ever yet hated his own flesh, but loveth it and cherisheth it, mm -hmm. nourisheth it. Ah. But see, these are lovers of their own selves in a selfish way. They, they love themselves above all else, mm -hmm. including God himself. And that is not... The way of scripture certainly we can we can love ourselves but we have to love others more we have to love god supremely well, isn't that the first and great commandment that we are to love god with all our soul and heart and mind and Amen. second is like unto it that we should love our neighbor as ourselves even going further luke chapter 9 verse 23 says that if any man will come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me Amen. We must deny ourselves, he says. We must put ourselves below him, put our wants and our desires beneath what God has told us. The men shall be lower than their own selves. Isn't the philosophy of the world to put yourself first nowadays, to, right. to do what is good for you and no matter the consequences to anyone else? No men shall be lower than their own selves. Said nothing wrong with loving yourself. In fact, if you really know your worth in Christ, you can love your own self. But for He loved you greatly. We know how we have to love Him more than all those. Amen. And He says, "Covetous is next." I think we all know that's one of the Ten Commandments: not to be covetous, not to be in a wrong way desiring the things that belong to another. Yeah, yeah. Over there, Exodus 2017, when He gives us the Ten Commandments, he lists several things. The neighbor's house, the neighbor's wife, the neighbor's ass, the dog, either. Anything, anything that is not rightfully ours, we shouldn't be longing for. We shouldn't be desirous for what belongs to others. But this coach is here, seems to particularly apply to love of money. And certainly we have people that are lovers of money today, aren't they? They bad. Well, that they seem to love money more than just about anything else. Mm -hmm. They want more of it and more of it. So I know we have to have money to survive in this world, but it ought not to be our chief desire. Amen. Hebrews 13.5 tells us, 
that we ought to be content with such things as we have, be not covetous, for you have said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Well, no, we said nothing wrong with having stuff, but it not to, not to control our desires, it not to be what drives our life. Mm -hmm. But rather, we should just be content knowing that God will never leave us, no matter how little or how much we have. That's Amen. Right. And then he goes on to say, boasters. <clears throat> That's those who brag, especially on themselves. You know, they're always talking about what they've done or how good they are. Mm -hmm. We see men like that in the political and social realm today, that they're always talking about how good they are or what they have done. There's no room for boasting with God. Amen. Romans 3, verse 27, regarding salvation, he says, where is boasting in it? It is excluded. He said, by what law? The law of works, nay, the law of faith. Mm -hmm. Faith completely excludes boasting. Amen. Mm -hmm. Then he goes on even farther in, was it a, Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, he says, God forbid that should glory, save in the cross for the Lord Jesus Christ. But really, the cross is the only thing we can boast in, that Christ died for us. But what Christ has done is the only thing we can brag or boast about, not what we have done. Amen. You know what? I don't like to do, I'm not very good at doing interviews for jobs because I don't like talking about how good I am. <laughs> Over the world, they like to talk about how good they are and what they have done and what they have accomplished. But right. That kind of leads into our next point here of the, the, the proud. They're very proud. The boasters are proud of themselves, aren't they? Mm-hmm. So they think themselves to be above others. That's what it means to be proud. Such is a displeasing mindset to God, isn't it? James chapter 4, verse 6 says he resists the proud and gives grace unto the humble. Mm -hmm. So we, as God's people, ought to be careful against pride. God never takes pleasure in pride. And we have to remember, that really, we, even if we are a quote, good Christian, it's only because of the grace of God. Amen. Amen. First Corinthians 4, 7, he says, For who make it thee to differ? So what makes you know, Brother Larry any better than even someone like Adolf Hitler? It's only the grace of God. Amen. That's right. What makes you know me or you better than the drunkard down the street? It's only the grace of God. Amen. If we simply remember the grace of God, there will be no room for pride. There will be no room for saying, "Look at me." Yet it seems that many professing Christians today are very proud in who they are. Mm -hmm. Very proud of what they say they believe and what they how they conduct themselves. Without being ahead of ourselves, they do think too highly of themselves, I think. He goes on to say, from the proud to blasphemers, it's those who speak against God or the things of God. We ought to always be careful about speaking against God and Amen. or God's men or God's church or really even just the ways of God. You see, it didn't work out too good for Korah and his group. Mm -hmm. They rebelled against Moses. Really, throughout scriptures, you see examples of those who spoke against God or his men, and they received a harsh judgment. Those that they were called children there in First Kings, I think it is, where they mocked Elijah, and the bear came out and ate him up. Mm -hmm. And we don't, we think, oh, that's nothing, right? But no, it's not pleasing to God to speak against him or his people. Amen. As much as you've done, the least of these you've done to me, Christ said. We want to turn there, but Paul described himself as a, a blasphemer before he was converted. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, over in his testimony in Acts 26, we won't turn there, but verse 9 through 11 tell us how he mistreated the first good people God, and he said he even compelled them to blaspheme. Mm -hmm. well, I don't. I, mean, I don't quite understand it in my mind, but if the world would have us to blaspheme, mm -hmm. 
I guess it's Satan's working on have us to speak against God and the, the people of God, the things of God. Oh, but there is mercy even for the blasphemer, Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1. It's when he describes himself as being one who was a blasphemer of God, and yet he said he obtained mercy. Mm -hmm. And going on to the next point here, he goes on from blasphemers and says, disobedient to parents. Mm -hmm. Well, that's definitely prevalent in our day, isn't it? Yeah, but it's more than just a ignorant disobedience. It implies that it's willful and even a stubborn disobedience. But the command of God is always for children to obey the parents. Mm -hmm. Colossians 3, 20 says, children obey your parents, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. And Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 says, children obey your parents, for this is right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What it leads to was first disobedient to parents and then disobedient to higher authorities. And Amen. Eventually disobedient to God himself. That's it. Uh, we won't get into parenting practices and all that, but we are to teach our children to be obedient. You're right. Amen. Well, it seems the world's teaching today is just let them, let them have fun, let them be kids. I mean, certainly they can do that. They still need to learn to obey. They learn to obey those that are, have authority over them. Yeah. Which is first and foremost their parents. So disobedient parents, you see that just going to the grocery store nowadays. You mm -hmm. see it on TV, you see it everywhere you look just about. It might be a sign of the times, but it's still displeasing to God. Amen. I think I'll say unthankful. That's unappreciative, ungrateful. Almost as if they think they are owed something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's very prevalent in our society today, too. The people who are very ungrateful people, aren't they? They get the command of God is to be thankful in all things. First Thessalonians 5 18. And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God and Christ Jesus concerning you. When people don't thank one another, much less thank God for anything much anymore. Amen. We just recently celebrated the Thanksgiving holiday, but it's mostly become Turkey Day and Day before Black Friday shopping to most people. Right. <laughs> Amen. Know how we ought to give thanks to God in everything. Yet we live in a very unappreciative world, a world that seems that they are seem to think that they are owed everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I've, I've seen uh, these pictures online. It says, here's a list of everything the world owes you, and it's a blank sheet of paper. <laughs> God doesn't owe you anything. The world doesn't owe you anything. Well, we have much to be thankful for as their people, don't we? Yeah. Let it not be said of us that we are unthankful people. And he goes on to say, unholy there's one brother Larry gets on a lot, doesn't it? Unholy, wicked, that's wicked or you know, holy means to be separate from sin, so unholy means not be separate from sin. Amen. It's impure. And again, a, we see this pattern here. All these things are contrary to what God would have us to do. This is contrary to the command of God. First Peter chapter one. Turn there for just a moment. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. But he says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Be bad. Yeah. We are commanded to seek after holiness, to seek after being separate from sin, being pleasing unto God. I don't mean holiness as in what Pentecostals teach. No, holiness is to remove means to be separate from sin, separate from this world, to be consecrated to God. Amen. Yep, this world is the exact opposite of that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Even many professing Christians are this unholy today, aren't they? They're just like the world. They're not separate from sin. They're not consecrated unto God or living for self. They're mm -hmm. living for 
pleasures are living for everything but God and his service. Verse 3 goes on to say back in our text, without natural affection. Mm-hmm. That's hard-hearted or without that affection that comes naturally, such as a mother loving her children. Mm-hmm. And that is one that seems very prevalent today. Mm-hmm. We, we see that mothers killing their children in the womb, that's not natural affection. Amen. We see other examples, and I think it's still naturally also for a father to love his children. And there's very little fatherly love in this world today. You got that. Hey, Amen. You know how it's even natural to have some what of a affection towards those that are around us, our friends and our family. Yet there's very little affection in today's world. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of talk about love, but they don't understand what love is. Right. There's a lot of talk about you know, love doesn't judge is the, new, is the saying you hear. <laughs> no love corrects, love admonishes, love rebukes. The love has a natural care for those that it, it's shown towards, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. And yet there's very little care for others around us. Very little compassion today. So how we as people of God love is the first fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? Love, joy, and peace. How we ought to be a very loving people. He goes on to say, truce breakers. Hmm? That's could be two, apply two ways, those that aren't able to come to agreeable terms or those who break those terms. A man is not a man of his word much anymore. Right. Man doesn't keep what he says, that's why we have to have lawyers and contracts and all those other things because you can't just come to agreements. That's why you have all these lawsuits. Mm-hmm. Some a very sue happy people. In the right. Country. Amen. We, we can't just simply agree and keep our word on things. But so it is in the last days, he says. He goes on to say false accusers. That's those that slander others, those who make up accusations. And Satan is the great false accuser. Mm-hmm. And so we would have, so he would be pleased if you will, that everyone would be like that, that he would. He brings up accusations against God's people mm-hmm. day after day. Amen. You know, we, we won't get off in politics, but you see false accusations when someone isn't liked by the masses. Amen. And I'm sure it will come to the same thing with us as the people of God. Enough time they'll accuse us of things, just like they did Christ. They accused him of blasphemy. They accuse Paul of blasphemy. So, false accusations are, again, against the command of God. We see all the way back in the Ten Commandments. Mm-hmm. They don't, shall not bear a false witness. Mm-hmm. But like I said, they did that in the day of Christ. They kept them bringing more and more people into the trial until they finally got something they could agree on. Right. False accusations. So don't be surprised when false accusations come our way as well. Mm-hmm. And he goes on to say the next thing here is incontinent. Mm-hmm. Medically, there's a incontinent and you can't control your bowels, but in this sense, it's lacking self-control. It's not, hey, it. not able to control the flesh, doing what the flesh wants to do regardless of the consequences. That's it. And that yeah. describes people today very well. But they just do what feels good. They just do what, whatever the flesh wants to do. They just, there's no self-control. To it. And yet, temperance is a fruit of the spirit. Amen. Temperance is the opposite of incontinence. Temperance is learning how to be moderate in all things. Learning how to bring this body into subjection. 
of this world, they are very incontinent. They're very uncontrolled today. Yeah. That. Which kind of goes along with the next point here. He says fear. That's wild or not tame. I was reminded of Job 11, verse 12, where it says, Man is born like a wild ass's coat. Mm-hmm. Man is born wild, unruly, untamed. Except for the grace of God, it will go on that way, won't it? Amen. Man can try to reel in his flesh a little bit, but he always goes right back to what it likes. The salad was washed, returned to her wallowing in the mire. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know, men are naturally wild and untamed, and that will be the course they will follow, except the grace of God intervenes. So we're born that way, and that's the nature of this flesh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good parenting and morals can maybe restrain it a little bit, but only the grace of God can change that nature. Amen. You, know, you can put a bridle on a saddle on an unbroken horse or a mule or a donkey. It's going to be a rough ride for a while, isn't it? Amen. Mm-hmm. The man tries to do that, but doesn't he? He tries to, to bridle himself, but yet <clears throat> this flesh cannot be bridled in and of itself. Because it is fierce, it is wild, it is untamed. And he goes on to say, the spiders are those that are good. That's those who oppose good and those that do good. You know, I'm reminded of Isaiah 5, 20, it says, Woe to them that call good evil, put, and call evil good, and put light for darkness. Amen. Well, today, people despise that which is good and those that do good. I'm not saying that there's no, quote, good in the world. There's still people who have do charitable deeds. There's still people who have some compassion, but it's mm-hmm. very lacking, and it's only going to get like, worse and worse as time goes on. But by and large, people don't want to do that which is actually good according to Scripture. Mm-hmm. In fact, they despise it. They would rather do the opposite, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they yeah. certainly don't like those who... We try to do that good, try to proclaim that good. Ultimately, God is what is good and what His Word says. Mm-hmm. Amen. And the world, by and large, despises that. Go well, on, verse 4, he says, traitors, or those who would who betray, mm-hmm. such as Judas. Right. Luke 6, verse 16 describes him as a traitor. So, Paul says here that there are going to be traitors, or those who betray us, those who turn their backs on you. Mm-hmm. So don't be surprised once again when someone who you thought was a real deal is a turns out to be a traitor. Someone mm-hmm. who you thought would have your back turns their back on you. And the disciples they didn't say when Christ said one of you shall betray me, they say, "Oh, yep, it's going to be Judas today." Mm. I think a little later, right out there, they asked John to ask Christ. Some of them in another gospel says they said, Lord, is it I? Well, there's going to be traitors, but they ain't necessarily going to be marked with a gold T on the forehead, are they? Right. Jude describes those who crept in unawares bringing in damnable heresies. No ungodly men. Even Satan himself can be transformed into into a life. Right. Says. We know how we have to just be careful of those. There will be traitors among us. And there are certainly will be traitors out in the world. The ones who pretend to be your friend and really aren't. Mm-hmm. Ones to pretend to are on your side and they're really not. And he goes on verse the next part of verse four, he says, pity. That's Acting rashly or recklessly. Hmm. It's, I thought it was interesting. This is words also used to describe a strong alcohol, a strong intoxicating hmm. alcohol. They're so like, intoxicated that they're reckless. It's mm-hmm. Not necessarily intoxicated with alcohol, but just with the things of this world, with, the, with wickedness, that they're reckless in their actions, that they're rash in their decisions. Mm-hmm. And such it ought not to be for the child of God, though. 
thereby be careful for nothing but my prayer and supplication to make your thanksgiving known to God. Amen. To make your request known to God. He says we are to seek everything by prayer and leadership of the Holy Spirit, not to be reckless and rash, not to be so filled with lust or wickedness or even literally alcohol and other things that we would act in such a way. No, rather let us simply seek the will of the Lord and His leadership with what we ought to do as a child of God. No, the, the world is not like that, are they? They want to act on impulses, don't they? They want to act just on what first thing that comes to mind, the first thing that hits them, isn't it? Mm-hmm. We don't live in a very patient world today. Right. Yet oftentimes the command of God is to wait on the Lord. Mm-hmm. Amen. And he goes on to say high-minded. This kind of goes back to the boasters and proud, but it's those who are lifted up with pride, those who are, who are haughty, those who think very highly of themselves. Mm-hmm. Let's turn back to Romans for just a moment. Romans chapter 12. And we like to quote the first two verses, and they're good. And we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice. We do not conform to this world. In verse 3, he says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man a measure of faith. Amen. We ought not to think too highly of ourselves, he says. Right. We ought to remember, as he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, that by the grace of God I am what I am. That's it. Yeah. Has God given you a great gift? Don't think too highly of it. So thanks to God for His grace. Maybe you're a great singer, a great preacher, a great, I don't know, whatever talent you may have. Maybe you're world renowned for something, and yet don't think too highly of yourselves. Right. Amen. Remember that it's simply the grace of God that makes you are what you are. Uh. I'm right, though. I think Brother Pink said, without the grace of God, even the most godly men would be timid as a mouse. Mm-hmm. Well, we ought to remember who saved us, where we came from, what, even how we got to where we are. It's not by any of our doings, is it? Amen. Well, as it says here, it says, God had dealt to us the measure of faith. Maybe you're you're more faithful, you have more faith than someone else. Don't think too highly of yourselves even in that. You know, maybe you know great truths that others don't, but don't think to yourselves too highly in that, he says. Right. You know, and everything, how we have to be reminded that it's only the grace of God that enables us to do anything that we do. Enables us to be anywhere that we are. You know, whether we're as great as Paul is in the eyes of man, or whether we're as insignificant as some of the twelve disciples, yet we have to remember it's the grace of God that makes us what we are. Mm-hmm. Not think too highly of ourselves. Not think that we are something that we're really not. In fact, I think it's another place Paul writes, let him that think he stands take heed lest he fall. Mm-hmm. Amen. If you lift yourself up too high, you're prone to fall very far. We go on to the last part of verse 4 here in our text. He says, Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Right. Here these are those that love pleasure more than they love God. Well, that describes the American society today, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Even we as professing Christians, we love just about everything else more than we love God. Everyone loves his entertainments and his fun and his sports and his hobbies. Mm-hmm. All those things take greater priority than God is in this. And when we love God's opinion, He'll take the priority. Mm-hmm. If God's blessed you with things, you can enjoy those. I think uh, Ecclesiastes teaches that, that man can enjoy that which he's labored for, but it's never to come before God. Amen. 
you know, we can have our hobbies, but oh, how the service of God to come first and foremost. That's it. When we love God more than we love pleasure, we'll serve Him above all else. In the mind of Hebrews 11, 25, when speaking of Moses, it said he chose to rather suffer a reproach with people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Amen. The world offers lots of pleasure, doesn't it? The world offers That's it. lots of things that feel good and sound good and look good. But sin is only for a season. Mm -hmm. Those pleasures are only for a season. They only last a little while. Sin always brings about misery and pain and suffering. Now serving God can also bring about misery and pain and suffering too, but mm -hmm. there's a much greater reward at the end of that, isn't there? Yeah. There's pleasures for all of eternity waiting the child of God. That's why we shouldn't get so wrapped up in the pleasures of this world, because it's they're all fleeting, they're all temporary, they can't bring everlasting peace, they can't bring everlasting happiness, they can't bring everlasting joy. Amen. But those can only be found in loving God and serving Him. You know, we live in a society that loves pleasure. We love to have it easy, we love to have it comfortable. And we want to sit back in our easy chair and don't <coughs> just right. coast on through. That's such is not the way for the child of God. And when we love God, pleasure of this world will seem very insignificant and the sufferings of this world will also seem insignificant. Right. Amen. But we have a glory awaiting us which cannot be compared to the sufferings of this world. But the world and all the false professors and even perhaps the genuine professors are going to love pleasure more than they love God. Mm -hmm. You can be sure it's not going to draw you closer to God. That's it. We'll go to verse 5 and we'll close. It says, Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And there's a few different ways you could take this, but I'm not reminded of the Pharisees. They had a, a form of godliness, didn't they? Mm -hmm. they, had, they were very righteous people. I mean, they were, Paul described himself as, as touching the law of Pharisee. He was blameless. He was really you could say perfect in the eyes of man as far as keeping the law was concerned. Mm -hmm. But he didn't but he denied the power of God, didn't he? Mm -hmm. When you trust in your own godliness, quote unquote, you're denying the power of God and salvation. When you're trusting to your own self and what you have done and what you are, you're really denying the power of God. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, there's these people who say they are godly and they deny him by the way they live. Mm -hmm. And really in denying him that way, they deny him as Lord of their lives. Christ must be both. He must be Lord and Savior. That's it. That's why they, Paul and Silas told the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's it. You need to be Lord of your life and Savior of your life. You can't really be one without the other. I'm going to turn to Titus real quick. Titus chapter 1. Verse 16. I'm going to read verse 8, or 15 as well. It says, Under the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Mm -hmm. They profess that they know God, but in the works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and every good work reprobate. That's a we, we can thank God when someone gives a profession of faith, but if someone professes to know God and then they live like the world, there's not a whole lot of hope in that profession, is there? Mm -hmm. They profess that they know him, he says it works, they deny him. Let it not be said of us that we deny him by the way in which we live. Let, us not be, let it not be said of us that we profess God but deny him in our lives. Amen. You know, he says back in our text, from such turn away. From these types of people, he says we're to turn away from them. They have nothing to do with them. Amen. Certainly we ought to pray for them. Certainly we ought to try to be a witness and testimony before them. But these who have a form of godliness, really all those listed in the previous verses, 
They're not our real friends. They're not the ones who Amen. ought to have an influence over us. We've got to turn away from them and turn to God and His people. Amen. So don't be surprised when we see more and more of this as time goes on. But it's not an excuse. It's not an excuse for us to become lazy in our service. It's not an excuse for us to become like the world and do these things either. Well, as hard, times grow harder and harder, how we ought to draw closer and closer to God. Amen. What was that thought?